Good morning, happy fourth weekend. Hello to everybody at home. I hope you're all doing well. I imagine some of you are watching near a body of water on the beach or at the lake somewhere, and I'm a little jealous, but I hope you're having a great time. Hope everybody got to see a few fireworks last night. Um, my dog is completely uh, emotionally traumatized after three hours of fireworks going off last night. And actually, on Thursday, a beautiful hot air balloon floated right past our house, and it, it was just stunning. And we were all outside looking, and then the dog comes out, stops, totally terrified, runs back inside, wouldn't come back outside for the rest of the day. Uh, even though we were all outside, the poor dog is completely traumatized. So if you could please pray for my dog that her distress would dis diminish and she would be okay. Hope everybody got their communion lunchable on the way in. Um, at home, we are going to be taking communion at the end of the service today, and so run to your kitchen, grab something that you can use. It doesn't have to be bread and grape juice. God will make whatever it is holy because I am pretty sure that the little tiny wafer on top of this is cardboard, but he can still make it holy. Uh, and so this is your communion lunchable for today. Speaking of, speaking of my dogs, I just have to share this with you. I continue to not be quite ready for this whole live stream thing. And the live stream team has given me uh, walking parameters that I am not allowed to go out of. And there's tape on the ground, but I, I'm not good with tape. I don't pay attention to tape. And so I actually have physical barriers to how far I can walk uh, between these things and still be on screen and... Uh, it's been suggested actually that they give me a dog collar so that they can give me a little zap every time I get out of the screenshot. And I, I don't know how I feel about that, but anyways, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll, I'll accommodate for you guys up there and, and try to stay within the screenshot. Last week, JJ did a wonderful job with our marvelous faith series and he covered the life of Moses and he spent a lot of time specifically talking about the infamous crossing of the Red Sea, the waters parting and the entire nation of Israel walking across on dry land. It would have been something to see. And so I'm gonna use my, my little barriers over here. So this is Egypt and this is the place of exile. So the Israelites have left this place and we're gonna pick the story up about 40 years later and a transition to leadership under Joshua. And so the Israelites have left and they are en route to the promised land, the promise of God. But instead of going straight there, they do this. For 40 years. They wander, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The Israelites get stuck in between. They get stuck in between the place of enslavement and the place of God's blessing and promise for them. And I wanna to suggest to you today that it was Joshua's faith that bridged the gap and brought them into the, pl the place of the fulfillment of all God's promises. I wanna also suggest that many of us have left this place of enslavement to sin, to death. We've received our salvation, praise God. We are out of that place, but some of us haven't yet reached this place. And we might ourselves be in a place where we're stuck in between, wandering. And so I think today that by looking at the life of Joshua, specifically the conquest of the promised land, that we can gain some insight on how to get out of the in-between. How do we get from that place 
to walking in, experiencing, knowing the fullness that God has promised for each of our lives. Amen? It's five, five things to show us what it practically looks like. What, is, what does faith really look like? How do I move forward in faith? I think we can get five things from Joshua's life. The first thing from the life of Joshua is we get focused. This is a toy magnifying glass because it's what I had. <laughs> we get focused. While under Moses' leadership, jo- Joshua was one of a company of 12 men, spies, that were sent into the promised land to check it out, to see what it was like, to prepare themselves for what was coming. Joshua and Caleb, two of the 12, come back and they're like, guys, it's awesome. They got grapes the size of beach balls. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's amazing, it's everything that we've dreamed it would be. It's lush and fertile. Let's go, let's take the land. The other 10 come back and it's like they had been to a completely different place. And their report is, there's giants, it's scary. It's rugged. We can't take it. It's too dangerous. And so they are the reason, one of the reasons, (laughs) that the Israelites continued to do this. It was sin and disobedience that disqualified an entire generation from entering into the promised land. It matters how we live. You know, during uh, maybe the first warm day during quarantine, early this spring, when things were still very, very unsure, and of course they continue to be, but you know, there's a little bit more on edge. Everything's new, everything's weird. I, I found myself living in a constant state of guilt as I'm home with my kids all day long. So if I'm with my kids and I'm doing school and, and I'm, I'm playing or taking care of them, then I'm feeling guilty that I'm not doing work. And when I'm working, I'm feeling guilty that I'm not with my kids. And it, it was this constant like tension and uh, I, I can't win. <laughs> and so one afternoon, it was, it was just starting to get warm and um, I, I decided to take the boys down to the river, skip rocks, whatever. And we're walking there and Channing says to me, this is the best day of my life. And I said, it is. <laughs> Thinking, this is not the best day of my life. <laughs> he said, yes. I got to eat banana bread for breakfast and we're going to the river. <laughs> And I, and I stopped in my tracks and I thought to myself, all right, my focus, my focus is way off. My focus is way off. You know when you're taking a picture with a, a decent camera and you, you want one thing in focus but then everything else kind of blurs into the background? That's what Joshua had done. He saw the giants in the land, he saw them but he saw the promise. He had brought the promise of God into focus. In Psalm 34, I believe it says, magnify the Lord, bring him close, bring him and what he says and his truth and his promises, make them your focus. Bring them close, draw them near. In chapter one of Joshua, God is commissioning Joshua to be the new leader. Moses has passed away at this point. And starting in verse five, it says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. 
I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. So God, right there, he outlines the promise. He says, this is, this is what you look at. You're gonna inherit the land that I promised your forefathers. But then he goes on and says, focus, Joshua, get focused. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Focus. It's like a horse with blinders on. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Focus that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He's telling Joshua, he's saying here, I need you to be possessed by this promise. I need you to focus in, to look at that promise so that everything else fades into the distance. I will be with you and I will make it come to to pass. You know, I've noticed in my own life that the way out of sin and sin patterns for me is not by rigorous self-discipline. I've tried. And I'm pretty disciplined. And I've tried. But do you know the way out for me? Do you know how I've been most successful? Is when I see the promise of God instead. When I focus in on, you know what, This, this thing over here actually isn't what I want for my life. I want what God wants for me even more. And it just makes saying no to the other thing so much easier when I focus, when I get focused on the promises that God has for my life. So church, to move in faith, to move from one place to the next, we've got to get focused. Number two, you got to get wet. So God didn't just want to tell Joshua that he would be with him in the way that he was with Moses. He wanted to show him. So the very first thing that God does is he says, go to the Jordan and cross it. Well, the Jordan is, you know, a large body of water. They got a lot of people. (laughs) And so, (laughs) and so in chapter three, God instructs them to send the ark first. And we know from Squishy Adventures that the Ark of the Covenant was the sign, the symbol, the carrier of the presence of God. And it went with the people wherever they go. It's, they followed the people, the, the presence of God. And so Joshua chapter three, it says, as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, And I love my translation of the Bible is sure to tell us. Now, it's a deep, it's a deep body of water, but at this time of year, it would have been well overflowing its banks. (laughs) We got to know all these specific details so that we can be even more impressed with the miracles of God. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the sea of the, of the Arabah, the, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, stood firmly on dry ground 
in the midst of the Jordan, and all of Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Now the point here is we gotta get wet. You see, sometimes we know the promises of God, but we're a little bit afraid to move forward into the promises of God because maybe we see the problems. We see the giants standing in the way. We see the massive body of water that's blocking us from where God is telling us to go. But the way that this story goes is that the priests, the water didn't part until the priests took a step in, until they got their feet wet, and then, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have seen that? I want to suggest to you today that sometimes the provision for your promise won't come until you get your feet wet, until you take a step of faith, until you step into the Jordan, until you feel the water, maybe the provision won't come. You know, time and time again, I've heard people talk about, oh, I'd love to go on a missions trip, but I just can't afford it. <sighs> to my knowledge, to Merle's knowledge, which is longer than mine, <laughs> not once, not once in the history of Grace Covenant Church has someone felt called to go on a missions trip and the funds not come in. Hadn't happened because God's faithful. <laughs> and so sometimes it just takes, you just gotta say yes. You just gotta say yes. Get your feet wet and watch God do something. I've had some relationships before that were strained and they were tense and I didn't know how to move forward in these relationships. I didn't know what God's plan was, what was gonna happen, but then I watched and I saw that as I just took a step forward, because God's always for restoration, isn't he? 100% of the time. As I took a step forward, as I softened my heart, or actually as I felt the Lord soften my heart, he does amazing things. But will we get our feet wet? Will we take that step of faith towards the thing that God has called us to? You know, time and time again, well, first Moses tells Joshua, and then God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. I, if you read the book of Joshua, it, it just pounds it in over and over and over again. And God isn't saying to Joshua, do your best, Try really hard to be strong. Try really, really hard to be courageous, okay? Try. No, I think what he's saying here is that when he says be strong and courageous, it's an impartation. God is making him strong and courageous. He's meeting him with strength and courage as he moves forward in faith. And what I really love is that at the end of the book of Joshua, he tells the people, be strong and courageous. Because you see, what God gives us, we can freely give away to other people. And so Joshua, at the end of his life, is like imparting strength and courage to the people of God. It's beautiful. We gotta get wet. Number three, we gotta get going. It's my running shoes. You do not want to smell these. Your masks have some use at this point in time. <laughs> we got to get going. We got to get up and get going. We've got to move and we've got to go when God gives us a plan and we go. The most famous of all of Joshua's exploits is found in Joshua 6, and it's the battle of Jericho. In verse 2, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See? Now, 
Imagine right now, he's saying, see, and it's a walled city. See, I have given you the city of Jericho into your hand with the king and all the mighty men of valor. And then the Lord goes on to spell out the most unusual battle plan in all of history. All right, Joshua, write this down. You're gonna take a walk for six days. You're gonna take one lap around the city for six days, okay? On the seventh day, you're gonna walk around seven times and then the priests are going to blow the ram's horns and the trumpets. And when you hear the long blast, all of the people are to give a shout. And the walls will come crumbling down before you. Talk about a battle plan, huh? Joshua doesn't hesitate. You know, if God had given me a plan like that, I probably would have been like, eh, I think that might have been old pizza. <laughs> I, I think I better consult a few people. I don't know about that plan. That is weird. But Joshua moves. He acts. He gets going. And he does it right away. So church, we have to get our plan through prayer. And then we need to be quick to be obedient. As I was praying this week, I felt like the Lord said, you know, obedience is not outdated. <laughs> We've gotta be quick to be obedient to the call of God. And we need to take possession of the promise. The Israelites weren't called to just go hang out in the land, they weren't, it, it wasn't about them just going in there, setting up a tent or two, but their mission, the promise was that they would take possession of the entire promised land. And Joshua 1, 3, it says, wherever the sole of your foot treads, I have given you just as I promised Moses. You know, chapters 11 through 12 in the book of Joshua are not the most stimulating, especially after you read the first eight chapters. It's, it's full of battle and angels, and it's, it's exciting, and uh, it's just really easy to read, easy to study. And then you get to chapters 11 through the end of the book, and, and it's just about the division of land. And it's kind of like, eh, eh. Well, the whole point of that, though, <laughs> is that they were taking possession of the land. Those chapters are outlining for us the promise fulfilled for Israel, <laughs> that they took it, each tribe going to a different sector of the land. The Israelites took hold of the promise they got going. <laughs> Number four, you gotta get up. So after Jericho, you know, they're, gosh, you gotta be confident after a victory like that, I mean. So they're looking on to the next battle. I don't know that Joshua took his time to consult the Lord, but he sends spies to a place called Ai. AI. In Hebrew, it means ruin. So we're not talking about the most impressive place in the world. Probably not a vacation destination. It actually says that it was probably inhabited by squatters. It wasn't, it wasn't like, it shouldn't have been a hard place to take hold of. So the, the spies come back and they're like, we got this. There's hardly anybody there. Just send a couple companies and we will wipe them out. So Joshua does. And they're routed. They're defeated. And they lose 36 men, which 
in an army of thousands, what's the big deal about 36 men? Well, this is holy war. The rules are different. Holy war is supernatural. It means that God is the one who does the fighting. And so to have any casualties whatsoever, it made them all realize God's not with us. And so Joshua has an adult-sized temper tantrum. (laughs) I've never done this. Oh, God, where are you? You know, forgetting like the 30-some years of his faithfulness for me. God, where are you? Why aren't you showing up in my life? I can't feel you, I can't see you, I can't sense you. Josh was like, why did you even bother bringing me out of the Jordan? Why? I gotta say, adult temper tantrums are way less attractive than two-year-old temper tantrums. At least we can forgive them a little bit, but. So what does God say (laughs) to Joshua? In chapter seven, He says, get up. It's not just my point. He actually says that to Joshua. Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Oh, Joshua didn't know that. He didn't realize that one of his people had sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. This is another key to holy war. They don't take plunder. It's not allowed. Now, I know every now and then God makes an allowance for it. But typically, it is a standard rule of holy war. You don't take plunder. Because all of the stuff that comes with the people, it's all pagan. So you don't, you don't take any of it. Well, one of the guys did. They have stolen, lied, put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up. Achan was the guilty man. He even confessed it. He said, yeah, I saw this robe. It looked really nice. I wanted to take some of these silver coins. What's, what's the problem? He buried them all under his tent. And the point is that all of Israel suffered for the one man's sin. And then all of Israel had to repent for the one man's sin. And I won't go into details of what happened, but I'll just say in the PG way that Joshua thoroughly deals with Achan. He thoroughly deals with his family. And so God responds in the very next chapter of Joshua says, all right, well done, go take I. And of course, they easily take the city. Church, we cannot be paralyzed by our past failures. We all fall down. We all have temper tantrums. We all mess up. We all don't get it right all the time. Get up. Get up. Get up and keep going. Lastly, and I'm going to go ahead and invite you to get your communion cup ready. Lastly, in our journey of faith towards the promises of God, I encourage you to get right. In Joshua 23 and 24, he's giving a farewell speech because he's about to die. And in in chapter 23, verse 14, he says, and now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. That means I'm about to die. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word 
has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. So church, our faith can rest securely on God's faithfulness. He is faithful. Not one word, not one word has failed. Not one. All his promises will come to pass. And then in chapter 24, Joshua encouraged the, encourages the people and says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers that serve beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. He says, he's basically saying, commit your life to him again, do it again. And I wanna encourage us today, if, if you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the best day to do that. But I wanna encourage all of you as well to recommit your life to Jesus today. And then tomorrow morning when you wake up in the morning, you can recommit your life to Jesus all over again. And then on Tuesday, do the same on Wednesday. God, I wanna live my life wholly for you. I'm yours completely. I commit my life to you. We can do it over and over and over again. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength, really. So I want you to go ahead and take the bread or the thing that resembles cardboard. <laughs> but guys, we gotta have a sense of humor about it, it's okay. Take your wafer. <laughs> In the Gospel of John, he says, whoever eats this bread, Jesus says, whoever eats this bread will live forever. <laughs> So go ahead and take and eat. You're, you are going to have to lose your mask for a moment. <laughs> Jesus, I thank you that you gave your body to be broken, that we could be whole. God, I thank you for eternal life offered through your son, Jesus. And take the juice. God, we thank you for the cup, for your blood that was spilled. We thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for erasing our guilt and setting us free from the power of sin and death. I invite you to drink. And then would you stand with me? And if you would like to recommit your life today. Would you just hold your hands out to receive? Jesus, we receive the gift of your life. We thank you for sacrificing yourself on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we turn to you today and we acknowledge that your way is higher, your way is better, your way is the only way worth following. God, we want to give ourselves more wholly, more completely to you and your ways. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. I ask that you would give us all a new measure of faith. That we would be a people of faith who consistently walk in your promises for us. God, I pray for anyone who has felt that they were stuck in between. I pray, God, you would take them through faith into your promises for them. 
God, would you help us to get focused, to get our feet wet, to get going at your call, to get up when we fall down, and to get right with you. We give you our whole lives. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, church family. I bless you to go. Have a wonderful afternoon. You're the best. See ya.